welcome to the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast, your guide to help you manage life, money, and multiples. Each episode, host Paul Fenner, Tama Capital's president and founder, and the proud parent of four amazing children, including one set of triplets, will provide insights on successfully sustaining an active lifestyle, career, and family through comprehensive wealth management strategies, financial education, and lifestyle planning, specific to parents raising twins, triplets, and more. Learn more, subscribe to the show, or connect with Paul at TamaCapital.com. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. Clients of Tama may retain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Are you struggling with career clarity? The ability to to determine what you need or want from your career and how you would go about finding it? Lisa Miller knows firsthand the ups and downs a career can bring, which led her to transition from a corporate role into a business owner entrepreneur. Lisa's transition did not happen overnight and required her to set aside time to honestly think about what may be possible in her career. Career transitions are one of life's most significant transitions and something we likely don't give ourselves enough time to think about until a shift is forced upon us. We also discuss the seasonality of careers, especially for parents trying to juggle multiple financial and lifestyle priorities. Lisa points out that there may not be a perfect dream job for you, depending upon what season of life you may be in. To help make career clarity a reality, Lisa talks about how she utilizes the pivot method in assisting people in finding that clarity. Please enjoy my conversation with Lisa Miller. So Lisa, welcome to the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast. I'm so excited to have you on because personally, I know several people close to me, uh, including my own family and some family office clients that are going through career anxiety. So to have you on right now is perfect timing. So welcome. Well, it's a delight to be here. Thank you, Paul. So I think the the best place for us to start for our our listeners is to have you talk a little bit about your background and how you got into career coaching, career support, career everything. Because I know you've written a book, you've got your own uh, podcast, Career Clarity, and we'll want to talk about you know both of those. But why don't you just let us know like your background and and how you got into exactly doing what you do and start there. What do you do? Certainly. Well, I am a career change coach and I come by that body of work, honestly, through my own life experience. I, when I first started out back when I was in undergrad and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to major in, because, you know, as so many of us are told, if you go to a university and get an education there, that your major is important because it's going to help you to get good jobs and it's going to determine so much about the course of your career. I was wrestling with this question of, should I be an economics major, a psychology major, or an art history major? And I remember even back in that formative decision point of my life, there were a lot of really interesting biases that affected my decision-making because even in that moment, right? I'm not even 21 at this point in my life. My thought process is which of these is most enjoyable. And I was certainly leaning towards psychology and art history. And then I came back to enjoyable. (laughs) Well, you know, I mean, I didn't hate it. I certainly was willing to do four years of it, but then the question came up for me of, which one of these is going to set me up to make more money in my career? And at that point, art history and psychology both kind of drifted off the radar. And ultimately my decision was made with that as the guiding principle and the guiding question. I became an economics major and went through my academic career in that way. But I kept feeling like that wasn't the whole story for me. I started doing internships in addition to my academic course load. And I was doing internships all over the place, Paul. I was doing internships working in uh, TV media. I was living in New York City, so I had access to all these incredible companies. 
I was doing publishing. I worked at the American Cancer Society. I wrote a blog. I did all kinds of different things. And in a lot of ways, that exploration that I did back in my undergrad years was kind of emblematic of the energy and the spirit that I brought to my early career. I often describe that season of life like I was a a manic Goldilocks, trying every bowl of porridge that was out there to try to find something that would fit. I started out my career working in nonprofits, uh, and I was the the new media associate because back then, uh, digital media was still seen as kind of sparkly and not sure if it was going to stick, and maybe this is this new fad, this newfangled thing. I spent some time then swinging the pendulum in the complete other direction, working in communications consulting in the high paced, frenetic traveling, lots of external presentations, kind of a world that that entailed. And I moved over to work in a startup. I was at an education tech startup because I kept thinking, you know, maybe I'll find the thing that fits me. If I work at a really mission driven organization, but one that's in the private sector, And I kept trying to do this triangulation process, thinking that I would finally find the one thing that fit and I wouldn't keep wandering around wondering, you know, why doesn't this feel good? What's wrong with me? Why can't I just figure it out? And at some point in my journey, I started to realize that everybody that I was seeing around me was displaying similar levels of professional discontent, if you will that they were okay, satisfied in their careers, but they weren't really, they didn't really look alive in the eyes anymore. If you know what I mean? Like there was, there was some sense of presence that felt like it wasn't there. And so I later in my career became really intrigued by this question of how do we make work work better for people? for the employees? And how do we help people to feel like they've got a sense of a true North star to move towards that isn't going to lead them astray or lead them, you know, from same stuff, different day, same stuff, different desk over and over again out of the, you know, four decades, give or take that someone's going to be in the professional world. And so it was, In that last chapter of my corporate career that I started to throw myself into the research around professional satisfaction and career pathing and how to make discernment decisions about what to do that's going to feel good for you. And eventually that spawned a whole business for me, a whole area of expertise that has now been the business that I've run for the last six years. And that is where the book was born from around helping you to get clear on who you are and what you want, and then use those navigational North stars to figure out the kind of work that fits you rather than the other way around. So there is so much to unpack there. So, so so let me, let me start with this. So when you, you made the comment about like, when you look at people, you could see their distress. Did it matter? Did you see what was the age demographic of that? Did it matter if they were young, middle, or old? I think it shows up differently in different seasons of life. I remember when I was observing it at that stage in my career, I was really noticing it, particularly in folks from their late 20s to their mid 40s, that it was something that felt very visible. And I I would argue that perhaps there are now, knowing that, I'm a little bit older and hopefully a little bit wiser and that the, the dividing lines in the ages between generations have shifted a bit since uh, I was making those initial observations. I think that there are some generational norms about how we are allowed to express what we want that we are not getting that may also influence how visible it is about whether or not somebody is, is feeling satisfied and fulfilled in the work that they're doing. So how did you, so over the course of how your, your initial career that you laid out, like how, like, what's the time period that we're talking about? Is it like your early twenties, several years before you started, you know, kind of dabbling, if you will, in this in-depth career psychology aspect. It was the first decade 
So I like to think that the, the first 10 years of my career were all about trying to figure out how to, to work the corporate game and figure out what I was doing wrong that made it feel so unsatisfying and why I wasn't making good decisions and why I couldn't move from one position to another and feel like I was in a net positive position in terms of satisfaction, fulfillment, um, sustainability in my path. So how did you, and I know this is probably, this is going to probably strike a chord with a lot of our listeners is how did you transition from your corporate world into your new business? Because that's something that that's very um, close to me because as a, you know, corporate career driven person before I started Tama, that's what I did. I actually started Tama really as a, as a side hustle now that we call it or side business well over 10 years ago. So the, the firm will be 11 years old this December. The day my triplets were born is officially the day I started it. But I was already working with people well beyond that. But I never thought about turning it into my, my destiny, if you will. Like this is what I was going to be doing, even though subconsciously there's probably something really drawing me to that. Because I started investing when I was 13 years old. And now I'm 45. Well, you know, I, I'll respond to you through two lenses as sort of the lived personal experience and then kind of putting on the practitioner hat around how to navigate career change. Because some of the things that I accidentally did have fallen into a lot of what I've seen to be the research best practices about how to successfully make a transition. So when I was recognizing that I was unhappy in my corporate trajectory, and that I really wasn't seeing a path towards happiness within my corporate trajectory. The first place that my mind went to was where do I find the happy? It wasn't what's going to turn into a, a profitable, lucrative entrepreneurial endeavor for me. It was starting at the baseline of, well, what would feel good? What would light me up? And is there any element of what I'm doing in my current day-to-day -day job that might be able to sustain me more than the way that it's currently structured or the way that my time is currently allocated? And what I remember noticing probably back in 2013, so two years before I even started the business, was that I really loved the ability to sit down with folks on my team, direct reports. Uh, folks who I was collaborating with on projects, interns, you name it, and have conversations about what they wanted in their careers and lives, who they wanted to be, how they wanted to grow, sitting down and holding the space for them to be vulnerable and explore and to dream. And so when I started to find the nuggets of aliveness and energy and happiness that were buried in my day. And were one of the reasons why I'd been able to sustain myself in that career for a decade. It then opened up some questions for me of, well, how do I get more of that? What are all the different pathways that that could be accomplished? And my first hypothesis was, well, maybe you need to become a counselor or a therapist, if you love having these one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks that are a little bit vulnerable, maybe that's where you go and what you do. And so I came up with this hypothesis, again, not necessarily going down the pathway towards I'm going to end up as an entrepreneur and do my own thing. And I had this hypothesis that I needed to test. So I designed a way to get some data on whether or not I would like to be a counselor, which was by volunteering at a crisis counseling hotline. And that four hours a week was so clarifying for me that I did enjoy these conversations, but I did not want to be a counselor, that it was a great baby step that was risk managed. So it wasn't burning bridges behind me. It wasn't going all in and quitting my job. It was very methodical. And uh, Paul, in a lot of ways, this is probably kind of dissatisfying for your listeners to hear in a lot of ways, it was a slow process. I think that's, and I'm glad you stopped there because that's one area that I struggled with. 
I struggle with right now when I have these conversations with family office, you know, clients or friends or close family is getting them to just take a step forward to think about doing something different, you know, outside. It's not, I think people think of it as either black or white. There's no gray. You gotta, you gotta test something, but in that process, you have to allow your, you have to give yourself the time to actually try and test something like your hypothesis. And that to me is what gets me really frustrated to be quite blunt and honest is that people want to do the change, but they don't necessarily want to take that first step and do the work. It's very similar to the wealth planning process. People know they need wealth planning or financial planning, but they're so paralyzed by the fear of getting started that they don't start at all. And it's a you know vicious downward circle. Well, and Paula, I'd be curious to see if, if this rings true for you and the folks that you work with too, but I would guess that because people who come to you are financially minded, right? They know that wealth management is something that they care about and they want to be strategic about. Um, they come in with a certain level of ambition and excitement, and there's a certain amount of wanting to guarantee ROI like I want to bet on a sure thing that often will keep folks from doing some of the creative exploration work and, and trying things out in a less pressurized way that can actually lead you towards the things that are going to have the highest likelihood of return or success for you. It's, it's funny that you mentioned that because when people go through the first initial discovery meeting with me, um, they're at the end of it shocked because they ask, well, what can I bring? You want me to bring financial statements, you know, all, all these numbers. I'm like, no, don't bring anything. Like, what do you mean? Like, bring yourself, bring your partner, bring your spouse. We're just sitting down to have a conversation. We're not talking about numbers. We're talking about your life, your lifestyle. Like, what are you thinking? Like, it has nothing to do with numbers. And that's the one thing that I've learned probably most about the field that I'm in now and myself and my business is that the numbers pair in comparison to what is really going on. It's the, it's a emotional conversation. It's figuring out where you want to go and what you want to do. And for a lot of people, it's the first time that anybody's either sat them down or they've sat down themselves to give them five, 10, 15 minutes to just think about what it is they want to do. And I wish I could, I could give that, gift. And it's really a gift, I think, to anybody, because if people could just slow down enough and get a taste of what that's like and to try to glean some level of clarity, which is in the name of your business, career clarity, is is absolutely stunning because people walk away like, oh my gosh, I never thought of that. And, you know, I think there's such a bias in our society towards just solving something, finding the solution, getting to the answer, getting it right, moving on. And it, I think creates that sense of zooming that you were describing where the slowing down process feels like such a breath of fresh air. And we see that happen in the careers world all the time, that if somebody's feeling deeply unhappy with what they're doing, they want to be able to go to a career counselor and be told okay, great. This is your next job. Go do this. You'll be happy. Everything will be fine. Put a nice little bow on it. But we all know intuitively that's not how it works. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure that you, with the people that you work with, like they may come and think, well, I'm just going to change jobs. Like the grass is always green on the other side. And I think this is kind of what sets me apart with what I do with my family office clients is that I've been in their shoes. You've been in their shoes. We've had these corporate careers and I, I'm as guilty of it as anyone. I've changed jobs thinking, okay, this is going to be the panacea. This is where I'm going to stay and you know, really thrive and launch my career and didn't work and tried it again, didn't work. And so I think you hit the nail on the head. Everybody wants this black and white solution and it's not there. It's not, there's no equation for figuring out what you want to do with your life. 
Yeah. Imagine if, if there were such a thing, right? There was one true perfect job that would make everybody happy and meet all of their needs and honor all of their values. I mean, you can, even in the hypothetical with that thought exercise, see how, how fraught something like that could be. And so the process that you take folks through of slowing down and being self-reflective before you try to get to the prescriptive parts it is very similar, very analogous to what someone has to go through in the career discernment process. That if you're unhappy, it's usually because something's out of whack. Something is out of alignment with respect to who you are and what you value. And so the first stage towards moving to realignment is identifying and diagnosing where the gaps and where the issues are. There's this term that, that I've been using with, with people often is before I subs- prescribe anything, I have to diagnose. So, you know, any good advisor will diagnose before they prescribe a solution. And that, that's been a, an idea that's been uh, ruminating with me for the last several months. And, you know, I'm putting it in practice with some of the newer uh, families that have come on board. Um, what, I, what I'd like to do is <laughs> I'll use the word pivot, which is ironic because in your work, I've seen this, this method you call the pivot method. How do you utilize that with your clients and within the work that you do? What does that mean? Pivot method. Well, when I was first starting my business, one of the first coaching certifications that I got was in what's called the pivot method. It's a methodology developed by Jenny Blake, who is an author, a speaker, and a a luminary in this space. And the pivot methodology is really a decision-making methodology that's not necessarily specific to careers, but certainly can be used in the career world. And the methodology goes through a four, four ish step process to help you figure out what you want to do next for your decision. The first part of the methodology is what we call plant. And that's the stage where you ground yourself into who you are, what you want. You come up with a a short-term vision of where you'd like to go. You remember your strengths and gifts and capabilities that can enable you to get there. And you really feel solid on your feet. You really feel clear on where you are right now and why. The second phase of the pivot methodology is called scan. And that's where you evaluate the landscape to see what's out there. You take a look at what, if we're talking about this in a career space, you take a look at what's going on in the market. You look at what kind of job titles seem to be associated with the work that you think that you want to do. You look at industry trends. You look at trends in your specific city. You just get a lay of the land and really map things out. And then the next phase is the pilot phase where you do a pilot program or you try a test. Given what you knew about yourself in the plant phase and given what you've seen in the scan phase, what are some of your working hypotheses about what might work for you and how can you design a small scale, easy to execute test to validate your assumptions and validate your sense of what's going on in the world. And then if you are successful, if your pilot program yields the results that you hoped for, then you go into a proper pivot and make the transition actually happen to move into whatever it is that you want next. So you can see how this methodology can transcend categories. So you could use this in health, in relationships, certainly in careers, but it's really uh, a, an approach for decision-making that can help you to feel more structured and more strategic, no matter what the topic is. So, and how you just explained that, that sounds exactly like the example you were giving when you went through the, um, the counselor and, and you tried you know, your hand at the, the crisis counselor center. It, it absolutely is. And it's funny because I did all of that on my own before I even knew that this methodology existed, but that was my next question. Did you even realize that you were doing it? <laughs> not at all. I don't think that the book existed yet at that point. Um, but Paul, what I'll tell you is that 
when I said that there are four ish stages to the pivot method, imagine that you've gotten to that third stage, the pilot stage where you're running your test and it does not go the way you wanted. You thought you were betting on a sure thing. You thought you knew what direction you wanted to go in, but you took this step to mitigate risk and run a trial and you figured out, oh, this is not what I thought it was. There's a lot of emotionality that can be wrapped up in running what turns out to be a, a not directionally correct trial, if you will, something that doesn't lead you to the outcome that you were looking for. And what happened for me at that point and how this overlays with the pivot method is that I learned from that trial and that example that therapy was not going to be the right direction for me, which, you know, in retrospect, saved me from a fairly pricey graduate degree, (laughs) but it still didn't give me any more clarity on where I did want to go. So I went back to the, the drawing board using the newfound information from this experimental trial to step back into that plant stage, if you will, and to reassess and reevaluate to say, okay, I still really like having these empowered conversations with individuals, but I definitely don't want to do it in a clinical setting. And that then opened up some new ideas, new possibilities for me around, well, what if there were other ways that I could support people? Maybe this is specific to careers. Maybe I should look at industrial organizational psychology. Maybe I'll look at career coaching. Maybe I'll look at going into HR. And that then led me into that scanning phase to say, well, what does that actually look like? What is a career in HR? What is career coaching? What would getting a degree open up for me? And then led me to the next experiment that I ran, which Paul is where our stories have a very similar uh, twist to them, which is that I started on the side of my full-time job doing a little bit of career coaching for friends and family and mostly doing it for free in the beginning to just get a sense of, do I like the being a practitioner? Do I like the day-to-day doing of this as a line of work? And as happens, when you start to pick up a side hustle that you really like, it started to grow. I started to ask for referrals and introductions. I started to do a little bit more development of thought leadership or marketing materials. And it started to get a life of its own uh, to the point that I was able to bring in what I would characterize as like 50% of what I was making in my full-time gig in about 10 to 15 hours of time and efforting per week. And I felt like if I can make 50% of my full-time income on about 25% of the time, that feels like a good jumping off point, a good inflection point. Once I can replicate that for a couple months, that feels like a good bet to say, I can probably hack this as an entrepreneur and I can figure out how to make this work. So Paul, I'd be curious to know in your story, if you had a similar decision point moment of, if I can get this kind of a run rate for this kind of time, then I can make my leap. Yeah, that's, those are really excellent numbers. And I I think back to um, literally almost 10 years ago or 11 years ago now, yeah, 10 years ago, where my very first family gave me my opportunity. And I look back at Actually, it was two because the, the bo- I had two families signed in the same week. And I look back to those two families and I think they both know intuitively. I'm very close with both of them. Um, that, was the, that was the foundation. But when I spring forward to three years ago, or actually now three and a half years ago, I was still doing full-time corporate and part-time Tama, if you will, still in 60, 70 hours a week, trying to juggle both. And it it wasn't working. And fortunately I had the, the good fortune of having a great career mentor who was basically pushing me to say enough is enough. It's time to take another, you know, 
transition or another, not necessarily leap of faith because the, the numbers were there to support it just like yours. But I think it was that mental block where, you know, you have the, I wouldn't say security because today in today's corporate environment, especially the higher up you go, the more unsecure things could get. And I had I gone through a transition before and uh, didn't, <laughs> didn't really care for it. And so, but it was at that moment where I had the, the fortitude to say, okay, the numbers are aligning. That's check that box. And then I had somebody there who had my best interest at heart pushing me to get me through the emotional block of it. Yeah. I think that recognizing that there was an emotional block of it is, is so important because I think that sometimes the emotional block can keep us stuck for so, so long in things that are not serving us. And if you have a fabulous mentor who can help to show you, or you have the the presence of mind to discover it for yourself, that you can do so much more and that you've been shortchanging yourself in your current trajectory, the kind of things that it empowers you to step into and to reevaluate the risk of, it's just incredible. And I, I think one of the things that's like when I went through my job transition um, during, during one of my corporate stints, it, it, it's so paralyzing, the, the fear of like, how is this ever going to work? You know, I gave my heart and soul to this place. And then for them to tell me you're not wanted anymore, um, it's very difficult. And the ironic thing is over the last three and a half years, Lisa, I've worked and talked to, and I kind of specialize in working with families that are going through transitions like this, where, you know, they've, they've lost their job um, for whatever reason. And at the time, it's hard to think, this is actually a good thing, but nine and a half times out of 10, I, I can't even think of somebody that it didn't end up being a better situation for them later on down the road. Because just, just as I mentioned earlier, like when, when you change jobs, thinking the grass is greener on the other side, you don't think about the fact that somebody just actually helped you. They actually helped give you the kick in the rear, if you, if, if you will, to go ahead and try something different or think about doing something different. Um, and it's, it's hard to tell somebody in that situation, don't worry about it. You're going to come out of this much better than you are right now. You just can't see it. It's easier to say that to somebody, but I think going through that myself and sharing, you know, my, my personal story, it, it helps, um, give credibility in, in, in an empathetic and understanding way that people can relate to and like, okay, he's, it's not just lip service. He's actually been through this himself. Well, and Paul, to expand on that, when you tell the story of who you are and why you made the decisions that you made, it's so clear how values driven you are. And especially if you're someone who is feeling like you aren't as clear on where your values are or how to live your life by them as directly that kind of a story can be so inspiring and motivating and galvanizing for somebody to say, okay, I could do that too. I think, you know, cause when I hear you talk about working 50, 60 hour weeks, and I think about the person that, that I know you to be through this business, it's like, well, shoot, that's so out of alignment. It's so clear that you, yes, you want to provide for and take care of your family, but you want to be there with your family. Yeah, it's a it's a definitely a double edged sword because you know, and Teresa would tell you this. Um, everybody knows how much I love what I do, and when I have families come on board, it's not lip service. Like these these families literally become part of my family, just like my own family, and and that's the uniqueness. That's what I wanted to build, and that's why I started as an independent because I didn't want to be part of a bigger conglomerate. I wanted to to be Tama and to have my name. Tama, most people know this, but Tama stands for Teresa, Aiden, Madison, McKenzie, and Andrew. So it's really easy to talk about what I do and the families I work with because my name, Tama, is literally family. Um, I want to go back to something we actually talked about. It kind of aligns to this, this one topic that we're on and allowing people to give themselves the time. 
So when somebody's going through a job transition, <laughs> they probably didn't think about what they really want to do before. And all of a sudden it's like, bam, like they, they're forced that they're forced to now think about it. When you're working with clients on the career coaching and counseling side, like how do you, have you found anything to get them to slow down and think about what they really want to do before a life transition forces them to do it for them? Oh, Paul, it's such a good question. And it's, <laughs> it's such a tricky one because I know, it's loaded. <laughs> well, so what I encourage anybody who is listening to this to think about is to start looking for what's next before you need it. Right. When they talk about that adage of the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the, the same rings true in a sense in career. You do not want to get to the point where your hair is on fire and you hate what you're doing, or you're so burnt out, you wish you could just sleep for a month, or you're in a toxic and abusive kind of a corporate environment. You don't want to get to the five alarm fire stage before you start thinking about what's next. If you have a quiet sense of discontent, it, it almost might feel like the gears are shift are grinding just a little bit as they shift, but it's not actively painful. You don't need to leave, you know, urgently. That's when you should start thinking about what's next. What brings me joy? What brings me energy? What lights me up? What do I want to lean into more in my career and life? to buy yourself as much time runway and financial runway as you can have for navigating a transition like that. When somebody is in a, a position where it is urgent, you have been laid off. There has been a life change that has been a forcing mechanism to shift some things pretty dramatically in your career. One of the biggest encouragements that I try to give folks is to stabilize first and then optimize. So start with figuring out how to get yourself into a sustainable survival mode. So if you only have four months of financial runway in your back pocket or in your bank account, we got to get you into a job. That's part number one. We don't necessarily need it to be the perfect magical, you know, glitter exploding out of your computer monitor, wonderful job to start, but we got to stabilize so that anxiety and stress do not take over and make the process more painful and scary than it needs to be. So stabilize first, and then think about optimizing. If you had your druthers, if you could have it any way that you wanted it, what do you want to move towards? And if you feel like the answer to that isn't immediately obvious, buying yourself the time and the space to start thinking about what are my values? What are my strengths and gifts? What are my interests that I would love to lean into more? What's the kind of lifestyle I'd like to afford myself and my family? And buying yourself some time by stabilizing to think through those questions in a way that doesn't feel as pressurized, that it doesn't feel, you know, coming back to what we've been talking about before, like you have to zoom, you have to know the answer and find the silver bullet right away or else the more likely it is that wonderful paths are going to reveal themselves to you in the discernment and the curiosity and the exploration process. And is that, if I come back to, to the pivot method, that's, that's basically phase one, right? To the planting phase, if you will. Yeah. The, when I think about the, the pivot method and the plant part, I think about it as being a very neutral kind of a process that it, it can happen in any circumstance. And I think what I'm wanting to convey is that if you can make your circumstances stabilized, it's going to make it easier to feel free in the planting and the scanning and the piloting parts of the process. Okay. One of the, one of the things that, that I know you wanted to touch on, which I thought was interesting, because when I was putting together my, my questions for our conversation, I didn't think of this is is letting your career evolve as your life evolves and talk about the different stages. Um, you know, a lot of our audience are, are, are parents like myself and you know, we're, we're struggling with so many, not only financial, but lifestyle 
priorities, you know, our kids, our career, our home life, you know, there's, there's no shortages of priority. So talk to us about how you work or, or guide people through this career evolvement, if you will. Well, one of the things I think is really important is to give yourself the space and the grace and the permission to evolve because kind of like I was sharing at the very beginning of our conversation, when I was a, a wee impressionable undergrad, there were all of these, these beliefs forced upon me that this decision is going to affect the trajectory of your life. And in some ways, being an economics major ultimately did change some of the things that were interesting to me or available to me. But had I anchored myself in the belief that I am an economics major and therefore that is the only thing that I can do for the rest of my career, I would probably be miserable working in investment banking in New York to this day. And as we know, especially when you become a parent, my goodness, your priorities in life shift so dramatically. And quickly, and like quickly. overnight. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, kids are such a, a beautiful forcing mechanism to help us decide what matters, what we will tolerate, what we are willing to put energy into. And it really sharpens our focus on what we want and what matters to us in our work. You know, when you're in your twenties, I'll just, I'll generalize. I'm sure you've got folks who are listening, who got married in their twenties, had kids in their twenties, had these life changes happen already. But when you're earlier in your life and in your career, the way that you weigh your values and your priorities tends to be different than the way that you weigh values and priorities once there are other people in the mix. And one of the things that I talk about, which is not particularly sexy to talk about as a career coach is that maybe there's not such a thing as the one true perfect dream job out there. Maybe what you're looking for, depending on your season of life, is the good enough job where you like the people well enough, you like the work well enough, it's getting you what you need on a lifestyle level in terms of salary or benefits. And that this obsession that we have as a society with finding the one true, perfect, beautiful, right job might actually be undermining our ability to see a lot of different, very viable, very interesting potential opportunities that might fall into this good enough category that actually would still be great. They just have a little bit more diversity than the way that you were thinking about potential directions. Um, I'll talk about, I worked with a client a couple years ago who is a fantastic project manager, just so smart, so sharp, so capable. She worked in IT project management. And when we worked together, she had this amazing, beautiful daughter who I think was 15 at the time. And her daughter had a lot of medical needs, a lot of medical needs. This poor sweet kiddo was going through surgery probably once every two months. Wow. And what that meant for doing career coaching work with her mom was that her mom could care less about having the perfect boss or doing, working on the perfect project. And what mattered for her in that stage of life evolution was having the best medical benefits possible for herself and for her family. And like I said, kids are a forcing mechanism towards clarity. And one of the interesting things that that happened was that when we used that as our guiding light for what we needed to find for a career, when we used that criteria of we need an employer that has absolutely phenomenal healthcare benefits, one of the externalities of using that as a decision-making criteria was that we found organizations where there was a strong culture and they were doing interesting work and they were well-known and respected, but we had to figure out the one thing that mattered most and the other things that she was willing to negotiate away to find a spot that was going to be a great fit. So ultimately she was able to honor tons of her values in this job, 
But when we used the good enough framing criteria for thinking about what could be possible, it allowed her to focus in on the highest value priority and need so that she could make sure that her daughter would never have to worry about whether or not the family could afford the next surgery. Or frankly, if this mom could take the time off to be with her daughter in the recovery process and to be with her at the hospital. That's I've, I've never thought of it that way, but I've, I've often heard this term and I use it frequently is don't let, um, and I, I, I'll probably butcher it. Don't let great be the enemy of good. You know, if you're 80% there, you know, don't, another person's told me this before, don't try being happier than happy. And it, it kind of makes me think about when the story, when I had the triplets and I tell clients this, you, you can, you can make a great plan. You can have goals, you can have parties and then life happens. And in my case, triplets happened. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like everything I had dreamed about, like starting this business, because I was in the process of doing it, you know, is all going to go away. I'm, I'm never going to do it. And that's not the case. You know, th- this, when, when there's going to be points in times where your, your goals and priorities have to take a back seat to what's going on now and what you have to take care of. And, but that doesn't mean that you can't come back to it. And I think it's, it's that evolution that in different seasons of life, we have to prioritize different things. And by trying to prioritize everything at the same time, uh, my best friend is a a graphic designer and a, a phrase that she will use is that when everything is bold, nothing is bold. That's a good one. And the same thing rings true in career. When you try to make everything a priority, it's not clear which out of any of those things is the most important, which ones are actually negotiable. So being willing to be a little bit ruthless in your prioritization based on whatever is going on in that season of your life and that evolution of your life and your needs makes it so much easier to make decisions and to allow yourself the spaciousness to flow and evolve and turn up the volume on some parts of your life and turn down the volume on other parts of your life as needed. So I, I know that we're, I only have you for a finite period of time, but I, I do want to get to your book, um, Career Clarity and your podcast. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, the, the message behind your book and, and the message behind your podcast. Well, The book was born out of a desire to share more about the methodology that I've seen that works specifically in the career space. You know, we talked about the decision-making framework of the pivot method by Jenny Blake today. That's so brilliant. And what I've seen is that when it comes to decision-making specifically in careers, there are four particular criteria that can really uh, determine whether or not you're feeling fulfilled and satisfied and like something is sustainable over the long term. And so I wrote the book Career Clarity to really dive deeply into exploring those criteria and understanding how you can do a self assessment on those, understanding how to come up with ideas for career paths once you've gotten clear on your values and priorities across all those different dimensions. So the, the book was such a, a labor of love and such an honor and a privilege to put out into the world. Uh, and you can find it on any online retailer that you like. We'll be sure to link, link, link to that in the show notes too. Thank you for that. Um, and if you're wanting a, a bit of a, a taste test of what the book is like, the Career Clarity podcast is a wonderful starting point. My desire with the podcast is to give education and inspiration on If you are one of those people who is kind of feeling like you don't love what you do, you can't see yourself doing it for the next 10 years, but you're not really sure what you want to do next. I want you to have a place to go to get stories, to get advice, to hear real people like you going through transitions, thinking through all the different phases of transition from starting at the, I don't know what I want, but it's not this side of things all the way through to How do I effectively job search if I'm a career changer or what are the steps towards starting a business? 
Well, I would, I would be remiss if I didn't um, note Melody Wilding in this podcast, because she's the one that, that introduced us to, to, to me, to you, I should say. And so um, I'll, I'll link to our conversation with, with Melody as well. Cause that she, she's been fantastic in this and with her new book coming out. Um, and so I'm going to, I'm going to slightly change or pivot my, my final closing question that I, that I asked most, most guests. Um, so Lisa, what is the kindest thing that anyone has done for you? You know, I think that the kindest thing that anyone has done for me the couple of examples that come to my mind are always nuggets of wisdom that someone senior to me took the time to sit down and tell me when they didn't have to, when I was just a peon and they could have gone on through their day, not ever thinking about me ever again. And their day would have been hardly any different. The kindest thing that people have done for me is always sitting down with me and giving me a piece of feedback. So I have a a former boss. I once referred to him as an old boss and I never heard the end of it. So a former (laughs) boss of mine named Bill and early, early on in my corporate career, Bill sat me down and he said, Lisa, I know that you have a lot to say, and I know you have a lot that you're thinking about in these meetings and you are quiet as a church mouse. And I don't want you to leave meetings with people not knowing that you were there. So how would it feel to give yourself a goal to make sure that you speak up and say something at least once in every meeting that you're in? And I remember how loved I felt in that feedback and how seen I felt in that feedback and how I appreciated his sense that I was infinitely capable and that I just needed a little kick in the pants to make it happen. And it's a couple of different moments like that, that feel like the most infinite kindness that I have gotten the the privilege to experience in my life. Well, I think that is the perfect way to wrap up our conversation. Uh, Lisa, I can't thank you enough for being on the Emotional Balance Sheet podcast. We'll have lots of of links in the show notes and on how people can uh, get a hold of you, listen to your podcast, the book, and and this pivot method that we spend a lot of time on. But Lisa, thank you very much for for time and, and taking the time to be on the Emotional Balance Sheet podcast. Well, Paul, thank you for taking the time to have me and kudos to you listening for being so dedicated towards your own personal and professional growth that you're taking the time to dig into this stuff. Good for you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast. Please visit TamaCapital.com to subscribe to this podcast or to connect with certified financial planner and registered investment advisor, Paul Fenner of Tama Capital. And please join us again next time on the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast.